With the hunt for the fugitive gathering pace, the man in question was desperate for a deal. As Jolo's phone calls to the Malaysian government continued, he turned on one MDB's partners in the Middle Eastern capital, Abu Dhabi. I'm still very, very close to Abu Dhabi. They are most concerned about the US mm. because I think that's something they believe is tougher to manage. Massive kickbacks flowed from a deal Jolo brokered between 1MDB and an Abu Dhabi government investment fund, chaired by Sheikh Mansour, the brother of the Crown Prince. In 2012, the Abu Dhabi fund guaranteed 1MDB bonds. Of the $6.5 billion raised, more than $2.5 billion was siphoned to offshore companies for the personal benefit of Jolo, Najib, his family, and Abu Dhabi officials. Abu Dhabi, they have admitted to, they, they have admitted to nothing. But when Jolo unleashed on Abu Dhabi, he claimed complicity and corruption at the highest level. The reality is Abu Dhabi people did take money. Mm. Uh, um, the discussion that I left off with them is, is look, whatever I settle with the DOJ that is used to pay 1MDB bonds, you all should match the same amount, uh, which is probably close to a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, their position has been, look, as Abu Dhabi Inc., we're not going to do that. So I think they're managing that quite carefully. <laughs> Recent US Department of Justice court filings reveal the $700 million mega yacht that Jolo rented to show Rosmar her pink diamond was owned by a company controlled by none other than Sheikh Mansour and had been bought in part with 1MDB money. The Abu Dhabi Royal and United Arab Emirates Deputy Prime Minister did not reply to our questions about receiving 1MDB funds. I've actually asked the current Malaysian government to actually pursue the matter because approximately $160 million uh, of 1MDB money was used to pay for the topaz. The huge mega yacht, that part of our money should be returned to Malaysia. It's about how each deal changes a community, a country and the world. By 2016, China was about to become entwined in the 1MDB global financial scam. Jolo's investment company, Jinwall Capital in Hong Kong, and another business consulting firm in Shanghai gave him a strong base in the communist state. The last we know where he is, he was in China. Uh, we knew that he was negotiating with the companies involved in one of the mega projects in Malaysia. With Jolo's help, Najib's government fast-tracked contracts with giant state-owned companies, including China Communication Construction Company, or CCCC, for massive infrastructure projects worth more than $30 billion. The highlight, a cross-country railway. We have always claimed, even before we won government, that the contracts were inflated. Double the actual value of the project, where the excess would then go towards various uh, uh, needs, including paying for 1MDB debts, as well as perhaps some pocket money for Jolo. I'm not going like, to confirm or deny it, mm -hmm. but I think the initial idea mm -hmm. was, you know, there was some intent that at least uh, if local contractors made like a substantial margin, mm -hmm. then, you know, a portion of that profit could be used to acquire certain assets okay. uh, of 1MDB. But keeping the money trail hidden from growing international investigations proved a challenge back in 2016. Again, Jolo turned to his friends in the Middle East, this time in Kuwait, enlisting the help of Sheikh Sabah Jabba Mubarak El Sabah, a member of the royal family and son of the country's then Prime Minister, and promoted an $8 billion joint venture between the Gulf state and China, seemingly as a smokescreen 
to channel excess money from inflated Chinese contracts in Malaysia. From 2016 to 2017, Hong Kong subsidiaries of the Chinese conglomerate CCCC transferred more than $1.2 billion into company accounts controlled by Sheikh Sabah. Almost $50 million of this was used to pay for Jolo's mounting legal fees and maintaining his assets. So, so he has had these pockets of funds being transferred and parked in various entities across the world, paying money on his behalf to allow him to continue to, to have a global presence without being found. Then more than $600 million was siphoned through a maze of Sheikh Sabah's personal and company accounts back to 1MDB to pay off a fraction of its debt, now standing at a massive $15 billion. Neither CCCC nor Sheikh Sabah responded to allegations of their involvement in the 1MDB scandal. In his 2018 conversations with the Malaysian government, Jolo was very careful not to implicate either Kuwait or China in his backdoor scheme to repay 1MDB debts. In fact, he appeared to be acting in the interest of China. I think the East Coast Railing is the most important. It was like President Xi's biggest uh, one belt one road program in Asia. But I think the Chinese position is, I understand that the current government may need to adjust uh, pricing and so on and so forth, uh, but I'm pragmatic. But I don't want to get involved in basically larger political items. So they're they are pretty clear, I think, on, on that front. Okay. I don't think they will throw him under the bus, but I think they are very concerned it impacts them sort of, you know, from a reputational perspective. Okay. The fugitive was perhaps well-placed to understand China's concerns. He was still operating businesses there and said he was calling from there. You know, I'm not sure, I guess, what the concern is, you know, with respect to Hong Kong and Macau, mm. whether it's because it's, it's a China thing. You all don't feel comfortable, you know, with, with uh, meeting in these locations. That's why for me, is I'm happy to talk by a phone or video call. You know, my question today, as it relates to Jolo, is if he is indeed in China, what's in it for them? China might have got involved in some of Jolo's schemes and might very well be protecting him because of information he now has about their participation. China is a signer on UNCAC, the UN Convention Against Corruption, and yet they completely ignore the rules. Interpol has placed a red notice for Jolo to be arrested. The United States has a warrant uh, for his arrest. The UN Convention Against Corruption should have some penalty. By the end of May 2018, Jolo was feeling the heat and he wanted Malaysia to know it. He warned their negotiations for the speedy return of assets was seriously in jeopardy. One thing to consider, um, and this is for you to report up to the leadership too. Okay, yeah. Is the longer we take, the more difficult it becomes. Once in the US file a criminal suit, any negotiation, you know, is going to be very challenging. Yeah. And he claimed he was starting to feel pressure from Najib's camp. Najib's youngest son, Ashman, who was on the mega yacht in 2009 as the first 1MDB scam was being planned, was barraging him with text messages. For example, when was it? Uh, Thursday at 11.38 a.m. He just sends me a message, don't trust anyone from the other side, a deal will be proposed, but it's a trick. The former Prime Minister's US legal team was also unsettling him. PM's lawyer, yeah, we talk to my US lawyer very, very often. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't fully trust them, but we think their information is accurate. Najib's US legal team was also acting for his stepson. Having received some $248 million from 1MDB, Reza Aziz spent it on high-end real estate 
and kick-starting a movie career, producing the Hollywood blockbuster Wolf of Wall Street. Was all this legal? Absolutely not. Like Jolo, he now faced civil forfeiture cases in the US and will become the subject of a criminal investigation. We think that in an effort to get Reza off the hook and potentially the Prime Minister and First Lady off the hook, they have been crafting this narrative, trying to pin the blame on me. Jolo also claims Najib's US lawyers, which included a former Attorney General, John Ashcroft, were furiously lobbying congressmen and even the CIA. He's getting me very worried because the more active they come, I'm just worried it gets way more complicated for, for everyone. I'm always disappointed when a former attorney general or someone else is knowingly representing a foreign kleptocrat. But as far as what Jolo is saying, I can tell you, even though millions are spent on lobbying efforts, I don't see that they're successful. But where those millions were coming from was clearly irritating Jolo. I think the important one to find out is actually who is funding their legal bills. Okay. Because I can tell you from someone that is facing all these things, it costs a lot of money. Mm. So I think if the funding source is chopped off, mm -hmm. you know, it just makes it harder for people to operate. All, all these things, they're basically using money to do, mm. I'm sure. And Jolo discloses Najib's lobbying campaign went beyond the US, pushing authorities in the UK to investigate Mahathir's global assets. They refuse to tell us who, but there's a very influential British individual mm -hmm. who has been in touch directly with the British Prime Minister. The same British individual has met the number three person at Scotland Yard, mm -hmm. and they discussed potential special operations being conducted to gather data on Tunmata and global assets. But back in Malaysia, Mahathir and his government seemed unperturbed. We have made no deals with criminals. Now actively in pursuit of Jolo, they issued an arrest warrant and Interpol read notice against him. And when the fugitive next called, he'd aborted a meeting in Macau with Malaysia's 1MDB investigators. But so I told them, you know, yesterday, like, there's now not possible and it needs to be in the UAE. He claimed he'd been forced to flee from his safe haven in China to the United Arab Emirates. Because of the whole, you know, war of arrest and, you know, effectively basically the UAE folks just didn't think it was safe. So I've just gotten into Dubai. Mm -hmm. The reality is, you know, uh, I mean, the UAE, but they are like ultra paranoid now. So I think it's going to be challenging for me to get any clearance to me. Having seemingly dodged Malaysian authorities, he was now suggesting he'd merely borrowed money from 1MDB. I don't believe there's any wrongdoing, but, you know, irrespective of that, um, all these ultimately were loans, uh, directly or indirectly, but, you know, ultimately, I think the time has come. We want to assist in, in repatriating uh, these assets, you know, back in return for, for cooperating and, and, you know, moving on with life uh, without, you know, being uh, prosecuted. I mean, it starts out with, like, there was no wrongdoing. If there were no wrongdoing, people wouldn't be giving back the assets, right? There would be no assets to be seized. I mean, it's comical. It's like, if I keep saying the lie, maybe somebody will believe me. Mahathir's administration definitely wasn't buying it. It's only fair that everyone's everything needs to be brought back. Uh, and, and it shouldn't be a you know, scenario that you know, some people okay you know, have to right. do it and, and then others okay. sort of get away with it. That, that's okay. sort of my, my principle of it. Okay. It, it, it's very unlikely that the interested party, yourself in particular, will be dissolved from any further action. It's very unlikely because the public will not accept that. I'm sure you are very well aware because in Malaysia, we do not have plea bargain. Yeah? 
Okay. Okay. I'm but, not aware of that. Yeah, okay. No. In Malaysia, no. No. The bad news got worse for Jolo. Days later, his Malaysian passport was cancelled. So too was the St Kitts passport he bought in 2011. But unbeknown to authorities, he still had others, including a Cypriot passport. Soon came a call from his lawyer, Robin Rathmore, from the global firm Cobre and Kim. Joe provided you guys with a, a you know, potential way forward uh, with a holistic settlement. And there were various offers to meet um, with Joe. Our biggest piece of leverage um, right now is that you don't have Joe. So we can't proceed with this unless we are satisfied that on your side, the good faith is that you're not using this whole whole thing as really just a, if you like, a smokescreen to try and arrest Joe. And the discussions became even more tense. Are you maintaining the position that um, there is no situation in which you can do sort of cooperation with Joe on the terms that have been discussed where uh, he doesn't go to jail? OK, Robin, I'm sure you know for a fact he cannot walk away. Yeah? He cannot walk away. Either he's going for a long time or slightly less. That's only his two options. Yeah, okay, well that's very clear. I mean, look, obviously I would say to that, uh, at the moment you don't have him. Um, and it's gonna be worth something to you to, to have him assist. And, you know, otherwise we will never find out the complete story. You know, you don't wanna be like hiding forever, but it's better than being in jail in Malaysia for 40 years. I can never recommend that to my client that he give up all his leverage and that he, if you like, sort of surrender himself to Malaysia if we're looking at, you know, material jail time as like a, as a deal breaker for you guys. Most jurisdictions are, are not even going to listen to, to that sort of bargain. At least here in the United States, you know, we, we basically do not bargain with fugitives. The fugitives' legal representatives are well paid for their advice. In late 2019 alone, Cobre and Kim received more than $1.5 million from the Kuwait royal Sheikh Sabah for legal and PR services for Jolo. Just eight months later, Sheikh Sabah was arrested for his suspected involvement in the 1MDB scam. Even with the law firm, I mean, you don't have a complete anonymity to not know the source of the funds that you're being paid. Because ultimately, if the law firm is knowingly taking in that money and then using those funds to uh, hire the PR firm, my next question would be, are they guilty of money laundering? You know, because they're, they're making it appear like legitimate funds. When we put the former FBI agent's question to Cobre and Kim, the firm didn't respond. In early August 2018, Jolo's equanimity was the first asset returned to Malaysia. Malaysian police have filed the first set of criminal charges against Jolo. The next few weeks and months would see Jolo charged with money laundering and bribery in both Malaysia and the US. Najib, who was facing more than 40 criminal charges, was bolstered. His new defence, he'd been scammed by Jolo. It's just ridiculous. I mean, you know, any simple person that looks at the facts is going to be able to tell what exactly happened. So don't try and start, you know, telling, telling everyone that, you know, you don't know anything. It's just absurd. The last Jolo recording is from late November 2018. Once again, he promised a complete list of all the assets bought with 1MDB money. I can do something up in terms of, you know, better depth on the, um, where I believe, you know, other assets are and so on and so forth. But he never delivered. And the man who stole billions 
claimed he was struggling. To be honest, like, it's a very different situation from I think, you know, when we last spoke. I think, you know, it's, it's quite stressful, you know, because, you know, we kind of pay our legal fees, it's, it's racking up, and, and, you know, we don't want this issue to drag on. I think the Malaysian government is the Malaysian government, so, so at the end of the day, hopefully, like many, many years later, you know, it would be safe for us to go back to Malaysia. So I think, you know, ultimately, we, we don't want to be seen as, you know, doing anything that, that is bad for Malaysia. Less than 18 months after this final call, Mahathir's coalition government collapsed, leaving open the possibility of Najib and his cronies returning to power. For Jolo, I'm sure his long-term thought is maybe the people that were involved in this scheme with him will once again become in a position of power and he'll be able to go home and not face prosecution there and not face the risk of being extradited to the United States. But for now, Jolo remains on the run and on the move. Despite arrest warrants and Interpol red notices, in September 2019, he reportedly flew to Kuwait. Then two months later, we can confirm he travelled again, this time on a previously undisclosed passport from the Caribbean nation of Grenada. Aboard a Gulfstream Learjet, he flew from Bangkok to Dubai, stopping for three days in India's Ahmedabad on the way. When and how he entered Thailand is unknown. The only way that can happen is through extremely high level uh, government assistance from, you know, hunting for one individual. If they do have um, f the full resources of one or more governments to assist them on maintaining their, their status as a fugitive, it's difficult, you know, it can be difficult to, to get them, but not impossible. Malaysian police accuse China of harboring the fugitive and obstructing his arrest. Sekarang ni pukul tak tahu. Bagi maklumat, takkan nak mencari seorang yang macam ni benda susah sangat. Sedangkan dia boleh melakukan peniaga, mem, mem, membuat urusan perniagaan. Bapa dia pun ada sana. Mak dia pun ada sana. Adik beradik dia ada sana. The communist superpower strongly denies it's protecting him. But sources in both Malaysia and Macau have confirmed that Jolo has been residing in a Macau villa owned by a high-ranking Chinese party official and businessman since at least February 2018. He still finds himself in a position where he's useful to certain people uh, in positions of power, whether that's strictly money or if it's uh, continued contacts. Um, but all of that usefulness is perishable, and uh, he's, a, he's a pretty young man, so uh, he's got a long way to go to keep himself uh, useful. Malaysian and United States authorities are still actively in pursuit of the fugitive. I'm pretty sure that uh, people who don't want to be incriminated would want him out of the country but we want him back. The people of Malaysia want him back in Malaysia to face justice.